The title that I gave from the chapter I'm writing for Zilka is uh, very long. It's taking up half of my 10 minutes, but I read it to you anyway. Actually, you could have more than this. I okay, it's okay. <laughs> D -d Diffusing chosen traumas through unsettling empathy, a conceptual approach to a case study on Palestinian-Israeli relations. What I really want to get to is unsettling empathy, because it's a term that I kind of um, made up to understand what happens when I facilitate groups that are in conflict with each other. So outside of my academic work as a scholar, I also facilitate different groups that are in conflict. I started with the third generation Jewish Americans and non-Jewish Germans for many years, and then I worked with racial um, reconciliation with different undergraduate student populations in the United States, and for the last six years also bringing um, Germans, Israelis, and Palestinians together into four to five day meetings to learn different ways of communicating with each other. And so when I talk about, when I use the term trauma, I don't mean it in a medical sense. I mean it in a sense of historical or cultural trauma that is working with groups and conflict. We're not looking at the individual traumatized person, but really as how trauma or certain events that we begin to call trauma now affect group relationships. And I actually want to start with an example. And in this example, I'm going to use a composite of two people and merge them into one. And I will only do this for this for here because it saves us time. I don't have to introduce two different people. Um, and I name her Yael. She's an Israeli in her, 20, in her early 30s. And um, she is more leaning towards the left, which explains why she would want to be participating in a, a dialogue program with Palestinians. And one of the stories she told that in her family, because she's also a grandchild of survivors, that every now and then her grandmother would take out a piece of soap and say during Passover meal, everyone needs to put it in their hands and remember this is what happened to our people. And most of you know the reference, even though historically we know there's some question whether people were really trying to do so, but that was the reference that she used. And uh, Yael said, and all the Germans in our group here was a 10-day program. I want you to hold the soap in your hand, and I want your hands to burn. She's also a teacher. She's teaching in a high school for very difficult children in Israel, actually in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And uh, these very difficult children, they don't function well in other schools. They are emotionally challenged. They're not physically challenged. Um, they don't function in other schools, so they're all put into this particular school, in the high school. And that includes um, settler children in Israel. And many of those of her students are part of the Beit Torah Club, which is an ultra-nationalist soccer club in, in Israel. They often chant fairly nasty racist slogans against Arab teams. And she's working with the student population, and she is telling us this story. She was kind of asked, everyone was asked to tell a story. It was her turn um, um, to tell a story for the collective Israeli. The Israeli group had to decide on one person that, to represent them. And so they asked her to tell a story, and she said, as a teacher, with my students who come from economically challenged um, environments, they have a hard time at home, sometimes they come out of abusive families, but I hear over and over again the DTA, DTTA phrase. And the Palestinians immediately knew and other people knew what it is, the Germans did not, and some people did not, and said like, so what is it? Said, it means death to the Arabs. And so she continued telling the story as a social, kind of a mixture between teacher and social worker. Except she was telling the story also in front of Palestinians. It was not a homogenous group uh, where you kind of understand the context, but you say this phrase in front of Palestinians, it becomes and takes on a different meaning. It immediately brings conflict in the storytelling to the fore. I'm using this example to make a few points. Um, first, as much as um, first-hand testimony is absolutely important for storytelling for traumatized people um, because we know that testimonial justice has to be done to people if people are not heard and we heard a lot about women who've never been asked and, and we need to listen to the stories and we need because testimonial justice needs to be done to these people 
and that is a really, really important step when, when you work with groups in conflict, especially if conflicts going on over time. Um, I think that storytelling is always mostly true, but never innocent. That individual stories are almost always true, but never innocent. That is to say, they always function within a larger narrative. Actually, they get meaning and are constructed within a larger narrative. We can call it master narrative or grand narrative or whatever you want to call it, but they have on their take on a particular meaning and, and, and are articulated within something that is much larger than the individual. That is not to say that the individual story is untrue. It's not a lie, but it is told within a particular setting. That is particularly relevant in the Palestinian-Israeli setting, but it's relevant in many societies that have been in conflict for quite some time. Um, so um, the way how a story is framed within the grand, grander narrative and the patterns that emerge in the person's stories are repetitive patterns, which is why if you go in some conflict situations, you seem to hear similar stories over and over again, because similar events happen to personal people, to individual people, but as a storytelling event in the um, relationship, in the group, um, it becomes no longer innocent. The story about the DTA, best of the air phrase, kind of was, lost its innocence, so to speak, the moment it was phrased in front of a Palestinian audience, or mixed audience that included the Palestinians. Um, second, um, if we just limit these encounters to individual storytelling, where we're supposed to listen with empathy only and respect, but not with interacting with the stories, I sometimes feel it has a mirror effect. You're telling the story, I'm telling the story to you if you would be the other, but really I don't see you, I just see my own story reflected in the mirror. I tell you my story of suffering of Germans after 1945, and you are maybe from Polish descent, and really I want to tell it to you, but really I'm telling it to myself. If there is not more engagement following, and that engagement um, part is to me actually the actual reconciliation work outside of listening and telling. Um, that brings me to the chosen trauma. We heard a lot about it. Most people know that concept by Barney Volkan, that the chosen trauma feeds, of course, into the grander narrative. It, it tells the community what, how to phrase a particular story. Um, I just give, give one example from my own culture into which I was born, the German culture, um, that Germany decided at some point that their chosen trauma is not Stalingrad. At some point it looked like it might be. It's not Auschwitz. It is not the occupation of France. But it is the last war year between end of 44 into 1945, when the German cities were bombed and the refugees and um, the people were fleeing and ex police when this became the chosen trauma for the German people after 1945. It's an interesting concept because it leaves out lots of things, and for many years Germany struggled with that because, because that became the story of German suffering at the expense of not um, looking at the victims of what happened before 1944. Now, of course, over time the changes, but even today, the certain generations, they only tear up if you get this widened foot footage of people fleeing from Eastern Prussia or Czechoslovakia or other places and the bombing of cities. They don't necessarily tear up the same way when they hear stories about victims. The chosen traumas feed into this problem of the personal stories are never innocent. And that finally, we yeah, have two minutes, right? Three minutes. Really, I could have Good. more time because I, I, we have. So the story I told um, with Yael, um, obviously some of the chosen traumas in Israel is the Holocaust. And by chosen trauma, you all know it's not like voluntarily chosen. It was a society kind of responded to the fact like this will most cap capture the essence of what we need to tell other people. One can arguably make um, a case that Masada features as strongly in the chosen story, chosen glory framework within Israeli society and you had mentioned it yesterday, and we all know these examples. It's also very clear that the closer the event is that we experienced, the less likely a population is willing to call it a chosen trauma, because it sounds like you voluntarily, you voluntarily adopt it as if you had a choice. If you say in America the chosen trauma is 9-11, most of my American friends would say, definitely say, like, this is not chosen, it's real. You know, chosen trauma is not opposed to real, it's meaning like, we use that as a framework to understand ourselves today 
and our personal stories within this framework. So how do we get out of this sometimes reinforcing grander narratives by simply personal storytelling of our sufferings? It can actually feed into that which we want to avoid. And that is when unsettling empathy, in my view, comes in. Now, generally speaking, empathy is an imaginative act um, to understand someone other than myself in relationship to other people, which functions both on a cognitive and affective level. That's empathy in general. There's been a lot of uh, criticism recently on empathy, that empathy might be a wrong concept, at least if we assume that empathy is always positive. There are a lot of scholarship that says, let's relook at empathy and those who take it really to the extreme say, like, a good torturer actually has to have empathy, because otherwise they can't torture a person. You can't imagine yourself in that person's shoes. You can't figure out what pain is the most effective in torture. So people use the empathy as a critical, begin to criticize us, our natural understanding of empathy is a moral good in and of itself. I don't belong to this school, but I'm just I'm acknowledging it, because for me, empathy is still a, a, a moral good, so to speak. Um, especially if by empathy we mean that it's an other-oriented perspective. It's really perspective about the other and not a perspective by which I imagine myself to be in your shoes only to inform my own thing. It is your otherness challenges me. So by unsettling empathy, then, I mean it is, an, it is you enter into a relationship with another person out of which you do not um, come out the same way you went in. That is un what is unsettling is that the empathy that you give to the other person is not one of pity, most of us understand this, it's more than compassionate listening. It is that this person's story challenges my assumptions about myself, my assumptions about the other person, and my assumptions about the values I hold dear, and my assumptions of how I look at history and the world. And that is a very, very, very uncomfortable place. And most people try to avoid to go there, including the groups that I facilitate. That is, the unsettling empathy unsettled the person that engages with you. So again, if I look at you for a moment, and you're just the person talking about the death to the Arabs phrase, and I'm Palestinian. And now the facilitator says, well, you need to respect that story. And I think, like, this story stinks. <laughs> you know, do you realize what you just told me? Um, if I'm not allowed to bring that response to the floor and then see what this person responds to, and we get to a very vulnerable place, a very vulnerable place in that interaction, then actually I don't think transformation happens. The transformative moment for me is in this very discomfortable, uncomfortable moment. How did the story end with Yael? I mean, there's never one end to the story. But um, in her particular case, um, um, it kind of lingered, the sense of death to the Arab phrase in the middle of our room. At some point, she realized what she said. She started crying. People kind of didn't know how to relate to this part. Two days later, it was last year, by the way, um, two days later, she had a chance in the evening to go with one of the Palestinian students into Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is in, in Area A. Um, Israelis are not allowed to go there without permission. doesn't mean that they don't go, but they're officially not allowed to go. Um, and it happened on the day when Abu Dhabesh was killed. The young toddler threw a firebombing in a um, West Bank home by a um, Jewish um, young settler radicals. Tension was extremely high. It happened on the day. In the night, she went with a Palestinian man into Bethlehem, um, and I would not have recommended it, but she felt she's, she needs to do this. And um, the next morning, we went back to the group, and she sat. She was getting up and looked. You were this Palestinian man who took me there. And she said, you know, I hate to tell you this, but yesterday night when we went down to Bethlehem at night to walk your dog, you were constantly on the phone making calls in Arabic. And I thought you were arranging for my hijacking. And this is tough to say to a person. Mm -hmm. right? And it has all the chosen traumas inside it's all in this if we unpack it. And um, this was the Palestinian. 
And as soon as she said it, she said, you know, I was afraid of you, that you would hurt, 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 hurt me, harm me, hijack me. His arms relaxed for the first time in three days. And he said, I'm so glad you said it because I suspected your mistrust all the time. And I finally can see you as a person. And it solved all kinds of little mic on the micro level, all kinds of things. I know the limit of examples. Examples can tell us only so much, but I'm just using this to illustrate in concrete terms what I mean by unsettling empathy. There's a few moments when it happens and that it changes people's lives in actually fairly significant ways. It doesn't end occupation in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or in any other conflict, but it changes something qualitatively and significantly in relationships. And that's what I wanted to get across. Thank you.